I'm Steve Rolls, I'm the Senior Policy Analyst for Transform Drug Policy Foundation, which is a uh, think tank, registered charity, campaign group, um, working in the field of drug policy and law reform. Um, I've been with them for about 10 years now. Um, I generally produce all our written outputs, um, policy analysis. Um, I also uh, engage in public debate, uh, in print and broadcast media and various public events. Well, I actually kind of fell into drug policy work kind of by accident. I mean, it was something that I had a sort of uh, peripheral interest in. But at the time um, Transform was set up, I heard about it. I was actually working for Oxfam on the, in their campaigns department. And my background was actually more in development work. I did my master's in international development. Um, I'd done a research project for the Medical Research Council working in India for a year. And I was working with Oxfam. Um, but I had an interest in drug policy because it did seem like one of those um, big social policy areas uh, that, that was in dire need of reform was rather uh, highly politicised um, and characterised by sort of multiple injustices and a kind of um, disdain for evidence-based thinking and that, that was very clear to me um, from my early engagement with you know politics and you know social discourse and, and talking at university and uh, reading the papers and so on so it was something I was interested in but I wasn't had didn't have had targeted it as a career option. Um, but when Transform was set up by Danny Kushlik uh, in the late 90s, um, I was based in Bristol, it was set up in Bristol, I'd, I'd had some contact with Danny and I just kind of fell into it really. But it, as the issue has grown and changed over the last few years, I found it increasingly fascinating and the debate has matured and the, uh, the reform position has become increasingly accepted and increasingly mainstream so it feels like we're making progress. So it seems like drug law reform and drug policy reform is one of the last big kind of monolithic um, social injustices still to be addressed. I mean some of the things from the last century be it sort of um, uh, women's rights or gay rights or uh, workers rights or sort of uh, some of the, the key racial issues have been answered both in policy and practice, but drugs, um, there is this still lumbering uh, political monolithic injustice that still remains to be addressed. So for that reason, I find it uh, fascinating and it's a time of change. So it feels like we're on the cusp of something really important. We've been looking at the debate around uh, drug law reform for, for years now and an important part of that is critiquing the war on drugs and the failure of the war on drugs, the fact that it's a policy that is supposed to protect um, public health and it's supposed to protect um, communities and promote health and, and, and safety and, and well-being generally, but seems to, or very clearly has over the last four or five decades that it's been in place, effectively done the exact opposite. Things seem to have got worse, um, it hasn't reduced drug availability, it hasn't reduced drug use, it hasn't reduced drug related harms, clearly all of those have risen fairly consistently and it's created all these other harms associated with the, the violent illegal trade controlled by gangsters which causes problems from the streets of, of London all the way to Afghanistan and the jungles of Colombia and so on. So there is this very powerful critique of the war on drugs but beyond that critique we have to say okay what could we do that would be better, what would protect the public or what would deliver better outcomes. So part of our work is, part, is the critique and part of it is exploring alternative approaches that might deliver better outcomes. And we've been focusing more on that latter side of things in the last couple of years. Um, and one of the projects that we've been working on was called uh, After the War on Drugs Blueprint for Regulation, which eventually matured into a book, which was published in 2009, is available online freely as a PDF. Um, that really looks at what the models, what, what a post-prohibition, what a post-drug war world would look like and how it would function. How could we legally regulate some of these potentially very risky substances in ways that would protect, better protect public health and uh, hopefully address some of the problems associated with the illegal trade. So that's what we've been looking at. Well, in terms of uh, what those post-drug war models would look like, um, we're looking at the concept of regulation. We're very keen to distance ourselves from the sort of libertarian free market legalisation models that some people have expounded, although to be fair, relatively few. We're not talking about uh, an unregulated free market free for all. And in some ways, part of the critique is that that's actually what we have now. There's very little or no regulation of uh, drug products and drug markets now because we've effectively abdicated all control to. Uh, criminal entrepreneurs who, who are, you know, only really respond to the laws of, of supply and demand. 
So what we're looking at is the kind of regulatory models that exist for risk, risky products and risky behaviours in almost all other spheres of life, be that uh, alcohol and tobacco, be that gambling, be that some forms of sex work or entertainment. Um, and in fact, one of the things that seems clear is that regulating risky products and behaviours is actually one of the key roles of government, and they do that in almost all other spheres of life. And to a greater or less extent, they do it reasonably well. There's certainly a well-established um, framework for doing that, and we've basically tried to translate some of that regulatory thinking into an area where traditionally or historically it's not been applied. So we're looking at regulating things like the products themselves in terms of dosage and packaging and uh, price pricing. We're looking at uh, regulating the vendors who sells these things, licensing and training of these individuals to act as responsible gatekeepers to those markets. We're looking at uh, regulating the outlets, so the, uh, the, the shops or, or retail frontages where they're located, hours of opening, their appearance, how they market and promote themselves or not. Um, and then, crucially, we're looking at uh, availability. Who would be allowed access to these markets in terms of things like age controls or, or licensed membership or licensed access to markets? There's a whole range of different models that we explore um, in, in the Blueprint for Regulation. And then, having looked at that menu of options, um, the second half of the book is really looking at some models of how we might do that for different drugs. Now, clearly, there's not a one-size-fits-all model. It would have, you'd need different levels of regulation, different intensities of regulation, depending on the product and where it was being available and to whom it was being made available. So we've, the five basic models are um, a prescription model for the most dangerous drugs within a kind of medicalized model for, for dependent or more hardcore problematic users, various forms of licensed retailing, um, which is more familiar with off-licenses and tobacconists, although we're not suggesting that's an ideal model. Um, various forms of licensed uh, premises for sale and consumption, like uh, pubs or like uh, cannabis coffee shops in, in the Netherlands, um, or uh, unlicensed sales. So you'd effectively have um, the, the, the lowest risk products, like coffee or, or sort of low strength caffeine products, would be sold um, uh, effectively like normal products um, in shops. One of the models that we're quite keen on uh, developing is uh, fits somewhere between the kind of prescription model and the licensed retailing model is a sort of pharmacy model, which is where you have a, a, a essentially a retail model, but the gatekeeper to that uh, retail access is a trained individual in the model of a pharmacist who is licensed and uh, supervised by an external agency and has specialist training and is able to restrict access according to certain criteria and is also able to offer uh, expert advice on safety, on harm reduction, on risk um, and is off able to guide people to uh, services or um, other information resources if, if they think uh, that that's necessary. So we've kind of uh, suggested these models for different drugs and gone into all the detail about how they would be regulated as the basis for a debate. We don't suggest this is how it's exactly how it's going to happen. But if we are going to have a debate around alternatives, we need to have some models, and so we put some on the table for debate, and we hope people are interested in talking about it. And from our experience of the last uh, year and a half since that book was published, um, people are very interested, and it's been very well received. Moves towards regulation would be progressive and phased over a number of years. Um, and even at the end point, if we ever receive, reach an end point, you wouldn't entirely get rid of um, illegal markets. Uh, there, there are illegal markets of tobacco, quite substantial illegal markets of tobacco. I think it's 25-30% of um, the market is illegal, although it's not entirely illegal. And as much as a lot of it is actually legally produced, then illegally smuggled as a form of tax avoidance. So it's slightly different. Um, and there is a smaller but not totally insubstantial illegal market for alcohol. So you're never going to get rid of the illegal market entirely. However, it would seem to us uh, substantially preferable to have 75% or 80% or 90 or 95% of a market uh, legally regulated and controlled rather than have it 100% in the hands of violent gangsters. So any move in that direction seems to deliver substantial social benefit. So I actually think the alcohol and tobacco models, even though they're imperfect, actually are substantially preferable to what we have now, which is this violent, chaotic, anarchic, uh, highly destructive, socially corrosive market, essentially controlled by cartels, gangsters and street dealers.
Now, getting rid of the illegal market or reducing substantially the illegal market and all the problems that come along with it is a key part of the critique of the drug war and the, uh, the argument for um, legal regulation. You can't get rid of it completely, but if you can get rid of most of it, that's still a good thing. Um, clearly, there are uh, the devil is in the detail. I mean, with, uh, with tobacco, for example, as you put the price up, um, you can increase tax revenue and you can, that can act as a dissentive to use. But if the price goes up too much, you start to incentivize undercutting and, and an illegal trade. So in countries like Andorra, for example, where there isn't any uh, taxation on tobacco and the packet of cigarettes is about a pound a, a pop, there's no uh, illegal trade at all. Why would there be? Because there's, no, there's nothing to be gained. There's, a, there's an enormous amount of smuggling out of Andorra and actually there's no smuggling you know, into Andorra because why would there be? So the government has the challenge of balancing these conflicting needs. Uh, both to, to undermine the illegal trade or to dissuade use. But the important thing, I suppose, is that they are in a position to make those choices. They can control the price and make those choices and see what the outcomes are and, and, and alter policy as they see fit. You can't do anything uh, with illegal products. You can't alter the price. You can't make those choices. You can't intervene on government. Uh, the government can't intervene on those key aspects of market regulation in any way because the market's controlled by criminal entrepreneurs. So again, whilst there is no uh, silver bullet, there's no perfect solution, we see government control as preferable to uh, illegal market control. I think there's an awful lot to be learned from the successes and failings of alcohol and tobacco policy. Um, clearly, there's an awful lot wrong with alcohol and tobacco policy. And I think it's entirely consistent with calls for better regulation of, uh, or any regulation, legal regulation of, of it, currently illegal drugs, um, to also call for better regulation of alcohol and tobacco. And that's something that we at Transform do and have done consistently since the outset, is call for better regulation of alcohol and tobacco. So we support um, the ending of sponsorship of sports and music events, um, generally the ending of promotions and advertising more broadly. Uh, we support minimum pricing controls. We support a whole range of the sorts of regulatory uh, models that we're, we're calling for for illegal drugs to be applied to alcohol. Um, alcohol in the UK is a particularly bad uh, model of practice. Clearly the industry has got far too much sway with government. There's a certain degree of corruption. The government doesn't really want to go there. It's not going to be very popular to put the price of booze up with, with, elect, with their electorate and so on and so forth. So there are a whole series of practical and political problems in terms of alcohol reform. But I think it's interesting if you look at tobacco reform, um, that has been, I would argue, a, a, a reasonably uh, good model of, of, of progress. And, but the difference is it's coming from a different point. You're coming from an unregulated free market as opposed to an unregulated criminal market. But if you look at tobacco uh, over the last 20 years, we've seen bans on advertising, complete bans on advertising. We've seen bans on smoking in public places. We've seen dramatic price increases. We've seen age of access has increased recently from 16 to 18. Um, we've now seen uh, health warnings on packaging. We're seeing, uh, looks like they're going to introduce um, storefront display controls and restrictions so and all that has actually contributed to a sort of 30 to 40 percent drop in tobacco consumption over the last 20 or 30 years since its peak in the, in the 70s and that's all been achieved without criminalizing any users and without um, abdicating the market entirely to to gangsters so we've seen substantial public health gains and kind of increasingly healthy social norms around the general unacceptability and uh, of smoking without um, having to resort to uh, h harshly enforced blanket prohibitions, but instead using sensible public health driven regulatory models. So I take some uh, lessons from uh, tobacco, we'd like to see similar lessons applied to alcohol, and I think we can learn from the, the failings of both of those policies uh, and apply them to illegal drugs. And actually there is going to be convergence around optimum regulatory models rather than uh, saying, look, this, if we legalised other drugs, look what would happen. I don't think that would because actually we're, we're increasingly tightly regulating alcohol and tobacco too. I think it's very important to understand the reality of where we are. Um, we might wish for a world in which there was no drug-related harm. We might wish for a world in which there was no drug use at all. Um, but the, for social policy, if we're being pragmatic, we have to accept the reality that some people, whether we like it or not, 
wish to use drugs. There is demand for drugs. There is uh, 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 clearly a kind of, at some level, a, a, a need or desire for drugs to be consumed, for people to change their mood or state of consciousness. Um, it, it, and it, that crosses societies um, and, it, and it goes back through history. So it's not something you can legislate away. It's not something you can wish away. It's not something you can uh, apply criminal or punitive law to, to and make it disappear. That is there and it seems from our experience of the last 50, 100, 200 years that attempts to get rid of that uh, latent desire for altered states of one sort or another um, using criminal legislation simply doesn't work. It just abdicates control of a market which could be within the ambit of the law and of the state to uh, criminal entrepreneurs. And it doesn't make the problem go away, it just makes the problem far worse. It makes dangerous drugs more dangerous and it creates all the secondary sort of community social problems associated with this illegal trade. So I think if there's one thing that I think people need to accept in moving forward on the drugs issue, it's that demand for drugs is there whether we like it or not and we have to pragmatically accept that reality and start to manage it in ways that reduce the harm that these substances can cause both to the users and obviously to wider society. Now I think it's entirely legitimate for the state, for the government to seek to reduce drug use, specifically problematic drug use, in the longer term. I think that's a legitimate public health goal. But I think they also need to accept that you can't do that using punitive laws. You can do that by educating people about risk, um, educating people about uh, harm and how to reduce it, but also giving young people in particular alternatives so that they, they aren't necessarily, they don't default into drug use because there's nothing else to do. I think you need to look at some of the underlying social drivers of problematic drug use to do with mental health problems, to do with social deprivation, to do with histories of abuse, to do with poverty and boredom and unemployment. Once you can start to deal with some of those issues, and, and inequality seems to be a key driver, once you can start to deal with those issues, which is obviously a much bigger social policy programme, then we might start to see uh, longer term reduces in demand and, and, and problematic use. But until then, we have to pragmatically accept the reality of demand as it exists now and, 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 and manage it in ways that reduce the harm it causes, because you can't wish or legislate it away. I think there is potential for reducing demand for drugs, uh, there's potential for reducing levels of use, there's certainly potential for uh, reducing levels of harm associated with use or uh, levels of problematic use. Um, the, the, there are, and, and I think there's nobody in the drugs field who is opposed to prevention of uh, drug use or drug harms in broad principle. There's a, there, there is, however, an active debate about what the best way to do that is. Um, the evidence base for uh, what you might see as sort of traditional forms of prevention is not, is not great. Um, things like the DARE program in, in the US have been pretty rigorous, rigorously evaluated and they've not demonstrated um, great value for money. They're very expensive and they haven't really delivered uh, the, what was hoped from them. That doesn't mean they weren't well-intentioned or that they were entirely wrong and there's clearly lessons to learn. And that, 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 but, but essentially, the, the evidence base for more traditional kind of uh, school-based prevention or, or, or sort of uh, mass media uh, prevention campaigns has not been great. It's not been completely flawed, but it's, it's, not, it's not been brilliant. Um, so the question is, well, what can you do? And I think probably looking at the bigger picture, trying to identify what the key drivers of drug use and problematic drug use specifically are is probably the best way forward. So looking at issues of poverty and inequality and social deprivation, looking at problems in the mental health uh, care system, looking at in child care system, um, looking at issues of parenting and, and schooling. You know, it's a huge issue, but generally uh, I would suggest problems of um, you know, problematic drug use reflects low levels of uh, sort of social well-being. So, you, and, and addressing that is going to be the key to reducing problematic drug use in the longer term. But that is obviously a much more ambitious, wider social policy program and debate. Um, and it certainly won't be uh, dealt with by, you know, poster campaigns saying uh, drugs are bad for you or, or such and such. Clearly, educating young people about risk is very important. But um, on the one hand, while we might want to do that, we might want to kind of try, particularly try and discourage young people from starting drugs or prevent or, or trying to raise the age of first use and those kind of things. Those are obviously laudable goals. 
Um, but we also need to take care that um, a, a significant minority um, can't be reached or that those messages won't impact on and they will try drugs. So we need to make sure for those people that when they do try drugs, they do so as, as, as safely and as responsibly as is possible. Clearly there are risks, undoubtedly there are risks, but we owe it to those young people um, to give them solid harm reduction messages so that if, if and when they do try drugs, um, they do so as safely as possible. So it's you quite mean, a trick. You mean illegal drugs when you say? I mean both you kinds mean of any? drugs. Uh, illegal drugs carry additional risks, both in terms of the law and in terms of the unpredictability of what you're buying and, uh, and the fact that you tend to use it in more marginal environments um, and not necessarily with the same uh, sort of patterns and behave safe behaviours. But um, we need to uh, reach out to those young people and, and educate them how to use, use those drugs as safely as possible if prevention messages uh, miss them and unfortunately for a lot of a lot of young people those prevention messages do, do either miss them or they don't have the, the, the desired impact so it's quite a delicate balancing act between um, trying to prevent people from using drugs at all and also if they do use drugs to prevent them from being overly harmed by those drugs. I would really ha have to say that um, in terms of what specific messages I would give to young people about drugs, it's just not my area. I am a kind of drug policy regulation, drug law reform geek. I'm not a public health education uh, youth specialist and I can't make any claim to. So it would be rather foolish of me to uh, be giving you specific messages. Obviously, I would be keen to, uh, for, for young people not to get involved with drugs. Um, and, but if they did get involved with drugs, I would encourage them to uh, learn as much as they can about the risks of drugs and learn as much as they can about uh, how to use those drugs as safely as possible. And there are a number of very good resources that, that I would probably direct them to who are much more knowledgeable and, um, uh, about these things than I am. Um, uh, well, there's a number of, uh, well, this is a very controversial area. So the Frank campaign is the government one. I think it's quite good. I don't think it's without its problems. Um, some people think that uh, its messages aren't strong enough. Some people think its messages are too strong. Um, it's obviously uh, other more independent uh, resources. Lifeline is very much a kind of harm reduction uh, resources. And then there are some of the more um, traditional prevention groups like the National Drug Prevention Alliance. I think people need to go and explore all those resources and, 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 and learn what they can and come, come to their own judgment. There's a lot of uh, debate goes on around um, comparing different regimes and different sets of outcomes between different countries. Um, and there's a danger when you do that of cherry picking. So you can take one country, and Sweden is often held up as that country, which has, um, by European standards, uh, fairly low levels of drug use, and they have, by European standards or by global standards, fairly strict uh, prohibitionist approach. Um, they don't make a distinction between uh, soft and hard drugs. I don't particularly like those terms, but they, they, all drugs are basically dealt with the same. They are illegal. They're actually very strict, restrictive about uh, legal drugs as well. In fact, alcohol is, is um, heavily taxed. Um, it's controlled by, uh, through, through government outlets. They effectively have a state monopoly on, on alcohol supply as well as uh, taxation and pricing. Um, so they have a historically quite a kind of prohibitionist, abstemious culture. And in fact, they actually use, it's interesting that that goes across medical, the medical world as well, they use uh, a lot less prescription drugs than a lot of other European countries as well. Um, the fact that they have a prohibitionist oriented culture and a very clear uh, policy aim of creating a drug free society and they have relatively low levels of drugs is often held up by people as well look this is what everyone else should be doing but it's also I think you need to acknowledge with someone like Sweden they also have um, very low levels of inequality they have a very kind of uh, historically kind of left-leaning society with high levels of taxation on rich people they have very low levels of um, poverty and social deprivation they have an um, amazingly well-funded welfare state um, so the, a lot of the, uh, what I would see is the drivers of underlying, uh, the underlying social drivers of problematic drug use are much lower in a country like Sweden that has this very kind of welfare state oriented society. And it may well be, and I think there's a reasonable case to make, that the low levels of um, inequality and the generally higher levels of social and personal well-being in, in Sweden may be, and, and their sort of historical culture um, in terms of drug use more broadly, may be um, 
more significant drivers of their historically low levels of drug use than um, their drug policy. I think probably the role of drug policy um, in terms of traditional drug policy, treatment, education and enforcement has probably been dramatically overstated by governments everywhere. Um, and in fact, it has fairly marginal levels of impact on, on, on overall levels of use. Um, it's interesting comparing somewhere like Sweden to Holland, uh, the Netherlands, which um, is widely perceived to be terribly liberal. It's actually quite a conservative country and they're, they're, they have quite strict enforcement on the supply side. Um, it's, it's, but but they, don't, they have more or less decriminalised um, personal possession. So uh, uh, if you're caught with drugs, you're generally not prosecuted or, or you, you don't tend to go through sort of, um, you're not generally processed through the, through the criminal justice system. And they famously have their tolerated cannabis coffee shops. And it is striking that cannabis use in Holland is not significantly higher, in some cases lower than some of their neighbours that don't have coffee shops and don't have decriminalised uh, outlet use and outlets so it's very easy to cherry pick and if, if you look at the if you look at the uh, European countries or world countries more broadly there's no clear correlation between intensity of enforcement or punitiveness of enforcement and levels of use or misuse there, there, there is no link so you have countries like the UK which by European standards are quite punitive and we have the highest level of, of, of use in Europe, or near, nearly the highest levels of use in Europe. And you have countries like the US, which is extremely punitive. They have five or six hundred thousand um, drug offenders or drug related offenders uh, in prison. And they have uh, one of the highest levels of drug use overall in, in the whole of the Western world. So, um, but interestingly, the UK and US, if you look at the kind of uh, UNICEF wellbeing charts, are regularly at the top. And it, you, you do actually, if you look at um, levels of well-being uh, or, or levels of inequality within countries and you, and you plot that against um, levels of drug use, it does seem to be more of, a, more of a correlation. So again, I would say it's the underlying social conditions which are the key drivers of drug use, not drug policy, which is the, the impact of which has probably been dramatically overstated. So yeah, I think there is, um, there's an important point that needs to be made about the fundamental injustice and hypocrisy of some drugs being uh, dealt with with these sort of punitive criminal justice responses, both aimed at users and in terms of uh, criminalising the, the supply. And other drugs are uh, not only legal and state sanctioned, but to a certain extent state approved or state encouraged. I mean, I was actually in the House of Commons yesterday on the way to an to a, a all-party drugs group with the drugs minister and on the way to the committee room I passed the, the, the House of Commons gift shop and there was House of Commons branded whiskey and I just kind of thought to myself and it was only recently that they stopped selling House of Commons branded cigarettes so there are actually House of Commons branded drugs these are if you go by the kind of Lancet uh, David Nutt et al uh, version these are class A drugs on sale in the foyer of the House of Commons with the government's stamp of approval on. And the government gives tax breaks of various kinds and, and lets, lets those industries push them around all over the place in terms of lawmaking and policy making. So certain drugs aren't just legal, they're actually allowed to, to aggressively market with, with, uh, with, with government approval. Now, I don't approve of that. I don't think they should be allowed to, to market that way, but I don't think they should be illegal either. Um, yet why are these certain drugs legal and these certain other ones uh, criminalised and uh, they, their users punished. And there does seem to be a fundamental injustice. It seems that the users of those drugs are being actively discriminated against within the law. There certainly seems to be scope for challenging that in terms of um, certain human rights legislation or, uh, I don't know quite, the, I'm, I, again, I'm not a lawyer, so I don't know exactly what the way, the way to do that with, would be, but there is a fundamental injustice in law that certain drugs are legal and other, one, other ones uh, are not and the users are, are, are punished um, and their, their behaviours are punished um, and they're, they're forced into the hands of uh, criminal entrepreneurs to, to procure and, and use those drugs. So there's something really odd going on there and I think highlighting that fundamental disjuncture between uh, alcohol and tobacco and, and other illegal drugs, cannabis, ecstasy and so on is, is a useful way of highlighting some of the kind of logical inconsistency and just outright idiocy of the war on drugs, not least because um, increasingly 
uh, alcohol and tobacco are being better regulated, and yet there's no debate around regulation of illegal drugs happening at all. So th th it's certainly an interesting uh, point to push, um, highlighting some of the hypocrisy around the way different drugs are, are dealt with by society and law. Well, I think the ABC system is grotesquely overgeneralized and oversimplified. Um, I don't think it's particularly useful. I think its utility in, in policy making is extremely limited. But my main problem with it, or, or a more substantial problem with the ABC system, is that it's not primarily there to educate people about drug risk. It's there to determine a hierarchy of, of punitive sanctions. And there's no evidence that that works. It it's not like uh, so if, you, if you move a drug up or down, uh, the, the classification, its use goes up or down accordingly. It's not as if drugs in higher categories are used less than ones in lower categories. There's no evidence to say increasing punitive sanctions are related to lower levels of use. There's no evidence to say punitive sanctions and, and, and criminalising criminalization of use has any useful outcomes at all. And yet there's, there's quite a lot, or, or as a particular, or any kind of effective deterrent. The evidence, the, the evidence base for deterrence of punitive sanctions is is almost is almost zero. The Home Office keeps getting approached and asked for it, or suggest that they do some research on it, and they've yet to produce anything. The, the evidence base of deterrence is, is incredibly limited, um, and yet there is actually a substantial body of evidence that suggests that criminalising young people or criminal records can be actively harmful for those young people. So they don't. Not only does it not help, it may actually cause harm. So my main problem with the rankings is not the sort of methodological issues about rank, uh, how you rank or whether you should rank, it's the fact that they're used to determine a, uh, a hierarchy of penalties. On the rankings themselves, I'm pretty wary of single index harm uh, figures for particular drugs that you then use to do rankings, like the stuff that David Nutz produced. I think it has some utility in the broadest sense. I think those papers that uh, have been in The Lancet have been quite useful for demonstrating that um, alcohol and tobacco and some other legal drugs are just as harmful as some of the ones that we uh, criminalise and, and, and have punitive responses to. Um, but I think that there are, the, the, the harm associated with drug is particularly determined by uh, the dosage, the amount you use, that your frequency of use, um, how you take it, the environment you take it in, and your personal uh, physical and mental health at the point when you take it. So to say drug A is more dangerous than drug B is only useful in the very broadest of general terms. For an individual user, it, it really is quite meaningless. I mean, cocaine, for example, um, ranges from drinking coca tea in a kind of traditional, uh, you know, Andean culture, all the way up to smoking, smoking crack. So saying drug A is more dangerous than drug B, particularly when, uh, well, particularly within with a fairly similar types of drugs, is I don't think it's necessarily particularly helpful. I mean, I think most people would agree that crack is more dangerous than coffee, but to say amphetamines are more dangerous than cocaine or something, you really do need to uh, the, the, uh, acknowledge that the key de key determinants of um, drug harms are social context and the nature of the individual how they use, when they use, regularity of use, dosage of use, um, whether they're mixing the drugs with other drugs and so on and so forth. There's so many other variables that just saying drug A is more dangerous than drug B certainly from a, from a user perspective is not necessarily going to be that useful. And from a policy making perspective as well, I question its utility apart from the very broadest terms. But the idea that you put things in three categories and that is somehow uh, any use at all, I, I would certainly question that the, the, the classification system, which was effectively devised in the 40s and 50s, um, when, the, when the, uh, the UN conventions were being drawn up, that we then kind of, uh, the, the 1971 Misuse of Drug Act then grew out of, um, this stuff is 50, 60 years old and it's long overdue uh, a, a review and a substantial revisit and probably, um, you know, probably abandoned and replaced by something a lot more sophisticated.